Moving from the United States to Israel is never easy, and the First Steps program helped me. They helped me with establishing my new lab, my dream lab in the biomedical engineering department. They helped with shipment costs and also with flight costs and even with housing. The greatest asset of any university are its faculty members who inspire and lead our students so that they reach their maximum potential. We must keep up with other leading universities around the world. To do this, we aim to recruit 30 new faculty members every year to replace those who leave and to keep improving our student-to-faculty ratio. For me, there was always the intent of coming back to Israel uh, as an academic, taking uh, all the experience um, I can um, to help me grow as a researcher um, back in Israel. The First Steps program, I see it as a very important part of the decision to come back, of course, but also enabling uh, every researcher coming back to establish a lab that could succeed and that could have world-class output. And of course, you have to have that investment, uh, initial investment in the lab to build it in order for that to happen. Through this recruitment, we also strive to bring home to the Technion some of the brightest minds and professors who are currently at other top institutions in the world. This recruitment drive is probably the worthiest investment for us and for you. We must recruit these people and bring others back home in order to maintain our position as one of the top ranking universities in the world and the most important technological institution in Israel. I think it's very important to encourage scientists with the relevant and uh, timely experience to come back to Israel and into Israeli academia. And that what makes the First Step program crucial uh, for the success of that process and to enable these scientists then to enhance the skills uh, of all the people around them, so uh, students and of course uh, other scientists. The First Steps program really helped me come back financially to the Technion. I know personally of a few friends in the United States or Europe where this type of program would really help them come back. And this program would also help the Technion in returning these great academics back home. Good evening to all of you watching us from all around the world. My name is Stephen Wiseman. I'm on the board of the Technion Society in the UK and I'm very happy to be part of this impactful series of webinars. With every online event, I learn something new and I grow my admiration to science in Israel and particularly at the Technion. Tu Bishvat has an exceptionally powerful meaning this year. Many claim that we have lost our balance and over abused our planet's resources, resulting in this horrible pandemic. It made us realise why we need to choose a different path forward. We have the power to destroy and the power to repair. COVID-19 has not changed the future yet, but it revealed deep flaws in the present. Tonight's speakers will explain and help us understand why it is about choosing to do things differently. Professor Levenberg is an exceptional researcher with a vision of eliminating the need to raise animals just for the sake of providing food to people by growing real delicious steak directly from the cow cells and without harming animals. With this groundbreaking technology, she also protects the environment. Cattle is the number one agricultural source of greenhouse gases worldwide. Professor Levenberg chooses to build forward the food revolution as one of Israel's leading scientists. Professor Orenstein is a professor of environmental studies and sustainability. 
He is studying human interactions with nature, cultural ecosystem services, and he is integrating scientific research with policy and management. He is an early advocate of using the pandemic for growing the momentum's we have everything to lose ideology. Before we start, please let me remind you that research and infrastructure at the Technion are significantly supported and funded with donations you send. If you can, please help us do what we do best. Make an impact and make Israel and this world a better, cleaner place. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to speak on Tu B'Shvat this year. I think Tu B'Shvat has special symbolism for us as we face environmental and public health challenges in the 21st century. Without further ado, I'll begin. Uh, my name is Daniel Orenstein. I am a professor of social ecology. I sit in the Faculty of Architecture and Town Planning here at the Technion. And in addition, I am also the faculty advisor to the Technion Sustainability Hub. We are responsible for advising on sustainability policy within the university. And before I start speaking, I'd like to talk a bit about the elephant in the room. And that's the fact that I'm addressing you during a, a very painful time, a very uh, uncertain time in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, as I do with my students, I start lectures by making sure everybody's okay, because I think one of the problems that we've had this year in communicating via uh, uh, internet, via Zoom, has always been the impersonal nature of the discussion, not being able to see one another, not being able to check up on one another and getting right down to business. So I want to just make it very clear that we are thinking of you as a community at the Technion. We're thinking of your well-being, of course, uh, people around the world. And, uh, and this is our campus right now. Our campus is currently empty of people outside, even though all the laboratories are functioning at full capacity, uh, and people are working, people are teaching uh, uh, via networks. The campus itself is empty and very quiet, and it's not very, uh, it's not a, a nice sight to see a physical campus without the people. The campus is as much the people as it is the community. Uh, but what it does stress also is, is the role of nature. And one of the things that has happened during this pandemic is our lack of access to natural areas. And that is a recurring theme in my research, but we feel it particularly also on campus, that inability to go out and, 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 and benefit from all the things that nature has to give us psychologically, physically, uh, uh, culturally, etc. So Tu B'Shvat is a good time to be reminded about that. And during a pandemic is even a better time to remember our dependency on the natural environment. Uh, so I'll start my talk today by talking a little about the Technion, and then I'll introduce myself. I'll talk about what sustainability means in general terms. Then I'll talk about what sustainability means at the institutional level, at the Technion, what we're trying to do to realize our commitment to the environment and to sustainability. And I'll talk a little bit about how our research program amplifies our impact beyond the university. So this is the, the Technion vision statement. It's right at the top of the screen. And it basically says we want to be the best at what we do. We want to be the best in the world. But we want to do that for the benefit of Israel and for humanity. So already from the first slide of our vision statement, we're already explicitly expressing our commitment that what we do is for the betterment of society. And that's going to be very important when we talk about our contribution to the environment and our contribution to sustainability. And there's a few more details about the Technion, Israel's oldest university, founded in, in 1912, uh, 19 departments, primarily the natural sciences and engineering, uh, also medicine and architecture, uh, and 620 faculty members. I'm not sure if that's exactly up to date. That number obviously changes. Three Nobel laureates, 14,000 students, who, as I said, most of whom are either in their laboratories or learning from home right now. Uh, when 
the current president of the uh, Technion, Uri Sivan, took office. In his opening statement to the community, he expressed six primary challenges facing universities in general and the Technion in particular. And among those are environment and sustainability alongside of human health. And I'll emphasize that he said this before the pandemic, so it was a little uh, a bit of foresight. Uh, state of the art production and education, but right up there in the top challenges, environment and sustainability, and the emphasis on the importance of interdisciplinarity when we approach those subjects, to understand those complex subjects from all of their angles and not just the technical aspects, not just the health aspects, but really the social, the economic, uh, biological, et cetera. So, so this really sets the tone for how we want to deal with complex issues such as sustainability, as I'll introduce. So what is that? What is sustainability? Uh, I'll start by saying what sustainability is not. Sustainability is not these global environmental challenges that are threatening the long-term well-being of humans on the planet. Global warming in the form of release of uh, uh, global warming gases, methane, carbon dioxide, the loss of biodiversity, the accumulation of nutrients such as nitrogen in the environment are threatening the viability of the environment and the life-sustaining benefits that they give to humans. We cannot continue on this path. This is not sustainable with regard to human well-being. Uh, I'll give one example, the biodiversity loss in the center. The chart shows you 100% of the biomass of mammals on the planet. Of that 100%, only 4% is wild animals. The rest, 96%, is humans and the domesticated animals that humans raise. That means that the entire planet is for humans at this point, and there's very little room anymore for other creatures and other organisms to exist unless they can adapt to our changes on the planet. Uh, a little bit later, we'll be talking about Shulamit Levenberg's research on creating lab-cultured meat. One of the environmental benefits, or three of the environmental benefits of this research, is that it addresses one of the main drivers of global warming, biodiversity loss, and nutrient accumulation, which is raising massive amounts of domesticated animals for our consumption, and that leading to some of these global environmental challenges. So that's what sustainability is not. What is sustainability? Sustainability is simply making sure that over the long term, the planet can continue to sustain human life, healthy, viable, and socially fulfilling. So in order to do that, we have to ensure that the ecological environment is healthy. Uh, and in addition, we have to make sure that human life is also socially and economically fulfilling. That is, we want to survive, but we want to survive well. And of course, we're speaking in terms of all of humanity and not just particular subgroups that are economically well off. So when we visualize sustainability, it has an environmental, an economic, and a social aspect. And the combination of these three elements is what uh, formulates sustainability. The United Nations has aptly expressed this kind of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary nature of, of, of sustainability and includes in its sustainable development goals eradication of poverty, access to water, education, gender equality. These aren't environmental issues per se, but when we talk about sustainability, it becomes an all-encompassing uh, uh, issue of human well-being that includes these other aspects in addition to preserving a healthy environment. So that segues into what I do. I'm a social ecologist. Uh, and this is my self-portrait. Uh, this is my self-portrait in, in, in uh, image form, uh, not a photograph, but rather an image. 
Uh, it's the integration of the social system, humans in all of their activities, and the biophysical system, the physical environment, and the interactions between them into a single system. Humans exist, they go about their business, their economic activities, their social activities, their political activities, their behaviors, and they influence the environment, and they create changes in the natural environment. The natural environment, in turn, provides different benefits, either better or worse, or different package of benefits, that is then perceived by humans as improvement or degradation of the environment, and the humans can respond accordingly into this feedback cycle where they influence the environment. The environment, in turn, uh, creates a different set of circumstances for humans to live in, and this relationship goes on and on. When I look as a social ecologist at the, at the uh, uh, global system, I'm looking at the interaction of these two systems. Now, I can't do it all by myself. Social ecology is an interdisciplinary field that demands the expertise of a large number of disciplines from economics to uh, physics to uh, geography, uh, including the natural and the political sciences and the humanities. So obviously, uh, I don't work alone. I co collaborate with many different disciplines to try to understand better the human impact on the environment and our responses to changes in the environment. And now I have three examples, very quick examples of what that means in research form. Uh, one of my projects, which I'm working with a doctoral student, Merav Cohen, is looking at the social ecological resilience of society in response to the coronavirus pandemic. That is, what aspects of societies, different societies around the world, granted them greater capacity to deal with this external shock of a pandemic, to be more resilient, to absorb the shock with minimal damage, or and or to adapt to the shock and change in any necessary way to assure the well-being of their community. So if we look from Israel to Korea to Japan to China to Germany, all of the countries respond in different ways based on their political and social systems and value structures, some better and some worse with regard to their, uh, to their uh, communities. So that's one project that we're working on. And of course, when we talk about social ecological resilience to pandemics, many of the same characteristics of a community that grants them resilience against a pandemic are the same characteristics that will make them more resilient in the face of wildfires, of climate change, of floods, and other types of disasters or external shocks. Another project we're working on, which is you know, one of my favorites because I have an affinity for wild boars who roam the streets of my neighborhood and also our campus in the Technion, uh, is the interaction between humans and wild boars as a symbol of broader interactions between humans and wild animals that have kind of made a home within human environments. And this work I'm doing with an anthropologist by the name of Yara sedetsky Verid, and she is looking at doing an ethnography of the interactions between the wild boar and the residents of my neighborhood in Haifa, and also within the Technion. Uh, and, and really what we want to do is characterize this re relationship, uh, what kind of values uh, are, are, are influencing people's responses, because in Haifa we have very vastly different responses to the presence of wild boars, ranging from fright and hatred to admiration and love for these animals, and this all, these different uh, 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 responses also play out in the political realm with the question of what to do about the fact that these animals are roaming the streets in our neighborhoods. Uh, so that's a second, uh, a second type of uh, research we do. And the last one I added, because it was so appropriate for what we're going through now with the pandemic, uh, the, the work of a master's student, Ofri Huta Zeitlin, uh, who's looking at the impact of Israel's national outline plan to strengthen buildings in the face of earthquake threat. Uh, and she really just wanted, Israel has a program that to to reinforce buildings that were built prior to the 1980s when there were 
earthquake regulations to make them safer. Uh, so the government offers all sorts of benefits for people to invest in their apartments to strengthen their buildings. Uh, and when people didn't have the money to invest in the strengthening, uh, they, they formed a, generally formed a private-public partnership with, with building contractors who were given rights to expand the buildings and in compensation, people could strengthen the buildings and in compensation to the contractor, they would be able to add more apartments to these buildings. So what happened essentially is that our urban neighborhoods that underwent this process of earthquake reinforcement was lo were losing open spaces at the private property level at a very quick rate. So Ofri, who is a landscape architect, stepped in and said, I want to measure this phenomenon and see what percentage of open space in the neighborhood level we're losing. And she found that we were losing because about 50% of the open space at the neighborhood scale was found in private gardens. Buildings that were undergoing this earthquake reinforcement were losing about uh, 30 to 60% of their space. So at the neighborhood level, we were losing, we were, excuse me, we were losing a tremendous amount of open space at the neighborhood scale. Why do I say this actually in retrospect became quite significant of a research project? Because during COVID-19, when we were restricted from going further than 500 or 1,000 meters from our home, then the, our private yard suddenly became our access to fresh air, to a little bit of green, a little bit of relaxation. So at the same time as we suddenly realized that we have this fairly significant need for close access to open space, we were also paving it over at a very fast pace, specifically in neighborhoods where this building reinforcement was taking place. So these are three examples of the kinds of research that are going on in my lab. Uh, now I want to share a bit of what we're doing on our university campus. Uh, why should the Technion aspire to a sustainability policy? Essentially, because universities are responsible for creating new knowledge. They are responsible for passing that knowledge on to the next generation so that knowledge continu continually accumulates. And they are also responsible for being good citizens. Universities, most of the, as public universities, owe their well-being to public largesse. They are, they, they are the recipients of, of funding, of tax dollars, etc., and they have a responsibility for returning that investment back to the community. So that basically means that through our commitment to sustainability in the community, we can utilize the three different things that we have to, that we can affect. One is our research program, the second is our teaching program, and the third is the way we behave on campus, the way we build our buildings, the way we manage our grounds, the way we deal with energy, water, and waste. So this is a busy slide, but it basically states the, the, the commitment that I wrote for the sustainability uh, uh, hub on campus that we will fulfill our responsibility in these three areas, research, teaching, and institutional behavior. Uh, and fortunately, we have a foundation for implementing sustainability policy on campus, and that foundation comes in the form of our strategic plan, Tech City 21, which was written by a very large uh, uh, consortia of, of specialists on campus and beyond and really instructs the Technion towards those strategic goals where we want to be in the coming years. And within that report uh, are, also, uh, are also guidelines or goals for energy consumption, transportation, water, grounds management, all of these sustainability issues. And in addition, and this report was approved by the Board of Governors and the administration of the Technion. And in addition, our controller, who's independent to the Technion, is overseeing, uh, this year in particular, is overseeing the Technion to make sure that we're fulfilling our obligations according to the strategic plan that we approved. 
so this, this is, gives us a very strong foundation to move forward. Uh, and when I became the advisor to the sustainability hub, uh, I think it was two years ago now, uh, the first thing that I wanted to do was institutionalize the Office of Sustainability on campus. When I and my students looked at universities around the world who were cutting edge in sustainability management, one of the first things we learned was that in each university, they had an administrative structure that was responsible. In the Technion prior to these years, there was an external body that was advising on sustainability issues, but it wasn't part of the administration. So one of the first things that we did, and thankfully successfully, because I think it makes a very, very big uh, contribution to our capacity to meet our sustainability objectives, is the creation of the uh, Unit for Management and Logistics which sits in the Department of the Operations, and one of the responsibilities of this new administrative unit is the sustainability hub. That is, the sustainability hub now sits within the administration advising on environmental and sustainability issues on all of the, on all of the relevant topics from transportation, acquisitions, building and maintenance, etc., and also research and teaching. Uh, and we work with Faculties, we have a group of faculty advisors. Some of them I'll show you their work in the uh, following slides. Uh, we work with the students and try to encourage student activities, uh, different uh, educational programming and activism. And in this way, we're trying to move these issues forward. So this office has only existed for the past year. COVID-19 in some ways has given us the space to really try to innovate and move forward as the campus is empty so we could as assess our environmental behaviors so that when students come back to the campus, we'll already have infrastructures in place that were an improvement on what was formerly. Uh, these are the issues that we're working on right now. One is to strengthen the organizational structure, which is the slide, the previous slide, working and encouraging energy efficiency, treatment of all of the waste flows on campus, both what is recyclable and what has to be landfilled and what can be reduced, and I'll expand on, on this in the next slide, and initiating collaboration. Since we've been in activity, we've established or, or, or uh, we've begun working with other Israeli universities to try to work synergistically to advance sustainability on all Israeli university campuses, and we're also working with the Eurotech consor uh, Consortium, a group of European technological universities that the Technion has several uh, uh, cooperative agreements with, uh, and also working on sustainability issues with our colleagues in Europe. Uh, of the two, four issues that I mentioned, one is energy efficiency, and here I'm happy to say that the, the uh, Technion has already been moving forward prior to the establishment of the sustainability hub. Uh, moving forward on solar energy production. This year, two more uh, roofs were installed in addition to the one that we had uh, previously. But also, the uh, chief engineer, electrical engineer of the Technion works with faculties consistently to reduce their energy consumption with kind of a, a uh, uh, offering them incentives in the form of cash back for the amount of energy uh, uh, consumption they managed to reduce, and this has been going on prior to the prior to the establishment of the sustainability hub. So I'm happy to say that this is a very successful uh, operation. Maybe perhaps the difference between what the sustainability hub brings to this effort is that we really want to go beyond what's economically viable and really push forward with a 100% renewable production, with a zero carbon emissions policy. These are kind of horizon goals, but we are going to push forward on those kind of much more ambitious goals rather than strictly restricting ourselves to what, uh, what is economically profitable at the time. So we can improve and we will improve. Uh, the second major issue that we've been dealing with here is to try to reduce the waste flow on campus. Uh, here again, we're looking at 
where all of our waste goes, whether it's getting to the proper disposal or recycling point. It, 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 it seems like it would be intuitive and easy. It's not. It's a complex process dealing with a lot of different bureaucracies, both within and outside of the Technion. Uh, and one of the first things we did was really to start quantifying our waste flows. So we're working right now with an external uh, consultant to try to quantify all of our waste flows and establish a sustainable program of waste disposal. And here, here too, the goal of the sustainability hub, in contrast to efforts in the past, it's not project-based where we try to get a recycling bin or, or a sign or a little bit of education out there, but we're trying to do this comprehensively to have one single policy technion wide that takes care of all of the waste flows and hopefully reduces the amount of consumption. Uh, and here you see that the technion uses in a normal year, not this year, in a normal year uh, uses more than 2 million disposable cups a year. We think that we can do much, much better than that and reduce that amount. And that's one of our goals uh, in the coming year. Uh, there, I have a dream <laughs> for where I want to take the Technion in the future. Uh, this will take a long time and a lot of collaboration and a lot of uh, work with my, my colleagues. Uh, one of them is to assure that all of the new buildings uh, abide by green building standards. The second is my own pet peeve is creating a quiet campus, a campus. If we, we've, I've queried my students year after year to go out on campus and kind of observe the environmental impacts. And year after year, noise is one of the things that the, the students complain about, whether that's gardening equipment or whether that's coolers and air conditioning units or whether that's construction. A campus should be something where you hear the birds and you hear your fellow students and faculty and not where you hear construction material, uh, construction tools and, and lawn blowers. Uh, but that's going to be a challenge as well. And the last is ecological gardening, taking it back uh, to my own uh, uh, field of research. Uh, I actually, in the context of my contributions to the master plan, to the strategic plan of the Technion, we kind of designed ecological objectives for managing the grounds of campus. And we published this as a, as a research paper as well. Uh, and hopefully in coming years, we can see some of those recommendations come to fruition in the management of our campus grounds, all the open spaces, the forest, the ecological garden, uh, et cetera. To conclude my talk, I want to talk about the impact beyond the Technion. And here I want to emphasize the contribution of my colleagues, because really one of the, the nice things about being responsible for the sustainability hub is the opportunity to promote the good work that's being done across faculties on campus. And I really want to spotlight some of them. This certainly won't be all of them. I chose a very uh, a small sample uh, to, to highlight the potential impact we have on society in multiple uh, disciplines. So I start with my colleague in my department, Professor Getty uh, Capluto, who is a specialist in green building, and in particular in uh, energy efficient building design. Again, I want to spotlight he's engaged not only in academic research, but also in his professional communities in Israel and beyond. And these, um, and these, uh, 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 the output of his research has a direct impact on the criteria with which we build buildings, their potential to be energy efficient, and, and, and the technological know-how to implement it. Uh, my colleague in, uh, uh, in civil and environmental engineering, uh, Professor Sabrina Spatari, is a specialist in what's called full life cycle analysis where she looks at different energy sources or materials and looks from their creation to their disposal or re, uh, recycling or upcycling, looks at their full environmental impact because when comparing two potential energy sources, uh, there are numerous environmental impacts in which 
option one could be favorable environmentally in some of the life cycle, but option two in different parts of the life cycle. So comparing these two is really comparing trade-offs between their environmental impact. And the classic example that we're using now is looking at disposable cups versus ceramic cups, which we want to deal with on campus because we want to phase out these disposable cups. But we're not completely confident at this point that that would be better globally for the environment. So we really want to look at the options, weigh the trade-offs in environmental impact, and then make a smart decision so that we improve environmental quality. Uh, and Professor Shulamit Levenberg, who you will see in, a, in, in another lecture, who's working on creating meat in the laboratory from a single bovine cell, muscle cell. Uh, and if you remember those three global environmental challenges of climate change, biodiversity loss, and nutrient accumulation, if we can reduce the impact of farmed animals through a technological advance, such as she is proposing and working with Olive Farms, a company responsible for marketing this product, uh, creating and marketing this product, then we will go very far in our, use, in our use of technologies to resolve those global environmental challenges. There, there are also units at the Technion, the Grand Water Institute, the Grand uh, uh, Energy Program. Uh, I put only some of the researchers who are working in these two different institutes that bring many researchers together. I emphasize these six because they're also active on environmental issues on campus and in Israel, and they're all faculty advisors to the Sustainability Hub. But I want to emphasize that these units bring together many different expertise to pinpoint their impact on energy, sustainable energy production, and sustainable water management. Uh, and these are some of the researchers that are, uh, that are contributing to that effort. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, at least in my mind, the units and groups that are organizing around bringing academic knowledge into the communities, into Israel, and beyond, and really having an impact, a hands-on impact on uh, a community, national, and global sustainability. And my examples here are the social hub at the Technion, which emphasized, this is in, uh, based out of my faculty in architecture and town planning, uh, dedicated to integrating scientific research with community sustainability, uh, such as bringing architect, landscape architect students and architectural students into the Haifa community to help design community gardens. Uh, the last example on formulating policies for petroleum pollution uh, uh, is the work of my students working with the Sustainability Hub and local environmental organizations in Haifa to try to resolve some of the more, uh, more egregious environmental challenges of air pollution and soil pollution and also the work of the Engineers Without Borders, uh, working, sending students to Africa to work in communities on, on technological innovation for their uh, environmental and poverty challenges as well. Uh, so I want to emphasize that. These are, this work amplifies our potential impact on uh, global sustainability. And on that very positive note, and hopefully these uh, these initiatives will continue to grow in the future. I'll conclude the talk uh, today. Uh, hopefully I gave a good taste of what the Technion can contribute to local, national, and global sustainability. And I encourage you to continue uh, watching for our innovations and work with us, if possible, to amplify our impact for the betterment of Israel and for the world. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have. All right. What are the major challenges in implementing changes on campus to improve environmental performance? That is a great question because our activities are all about challenges. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges is that uh, we're dealing with entrenched habits uh, of the way things are. 
and we have to change things for the better and change often takes effort and change demands of people to change their behaviors. It may de demand a reallocation of funding. It may compete with funding for other things. Uh, and, and that makes it very challenging to just as a force of change. Uh, second is that everything has to be empirically grounded because we're a community of researchers. So it's not as if we can grab onto a trend and say, wow, let's do this. This is the popular thing to do for the environment. Everything has to be discussed and empirically supported and compared. I was speaking earlier about life cycle analysis. So we have to have the, the best scientific data to support our decisions because, again, we're a community of scientists trained to doubt and to challenge and to debate. And that's no different in our committees for sustainability. Um, so that's a big challenge. Uh, the last is also competition for funding and for attention. Uh, there are other things going on. Not everything is the environment, although I'd like it to be so. Uh, I think it's the most, one of the most important aspects of our uh, uh, global challenges. Uh, but there, you know, there are other interests as well. Uh, so one is keeping it on the agenda. Two is always making decisions based on the best available evidence. And the three is changing uh, entrenched habits. I'll add a fourth to that actually as well. Some of our changes are dependent on broader Israeli society, whether we have somewhere to bring our waste or whether we have a, a supplier of particular materials uh, often depends on what's available in the market, uh, economic costs, uh, infrastructures, et cetera. So there's also that, that we're not an island, but rather part of a broader society. So another question. Um, why is it important for universities to be trendsetters with regard to environmental behavior? Also a good question. Uh, I, I emphasized earlier that universities are uh, recipients of, of public funding. Uh, we are citizens. We are responsible uh, for the public. Uh, and we're responsible for giving what we do and create, which is supported by the public, back to the public. Uh, and I think that's very important. Uh, during the COVID-19 epidemic, uh, we realized that universities are in a very fortunate position because they're rather stable, they're well supported, and as everything became very chaotic around us with a lot of economic uncertainty and a lot of instability, universities continue to be kind of these islands of, of knowledge production, of community support, of education, and that knowledge production, at least at the Technion, and, and I think in other universities as well, was immediately commandeered to deal with the very clear and present danger of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so uh, I think uh, universities in that way were realizing their responsibilities to society. And with regard to environmental behavior, we're responsible for implementing the very knowledge that we produce. So we're not just producing theory of what could be good for the environment or what should be done for the environment, but we should also be showing how to do it and actually implementing the very same expertise that we're creating on campus. We, if we have the opportunity, we should also be implementing it in the field. If that's energy production, if that's wastewater treatment, if that's uh, uh, you know, architecture and design, we have the capacity, we have the knowledge, and we're advocating it in academic circles. We can also advocate it and realize it uh, physically at the university. Any, uh, one more question. Are you optimistic regarding global sustainability? <sighs> we have to be optimistic. Uh, uh, if, if Look, we, we have the know-how, we have the knowledge, we have the capacity to resolve the problems. We've characterized them. We know the causes, climate change, biodiversity loss. We know these things and their drivers. We can be optimistic in that we don't have to further define or characterize the problem, perhaps, you know, find details, but really we have to utilize the energy 
and the uh, political capacity of society to make those changes. And I, I obviously believe we can. If we know the target, it's just a matter of how do we bring society, nations, communities, the international society towards those solutions. And there's a lot of promising trends as, as bleak as these problems seem and immediate, and they are. There are promising trends in the European Union, which is, is very tightly connected through funding agencies and through uh, political uh, uh, um, agreements uh, through the United Nations. There are very promising trends in pulling us towards energy, uh, clean energy, towards anti-poverty measures through water provision. Uh, and and I'm, I'm optimistic about those things. We have to give attention and support for those positive trends to deal with these well-defined problems that we sh should know how to deal with. Do we have time for more questions? Okay, that's... How do you know that the changes you recommend, such as the move to disposable and multiple-use cups, is actually better for the environment? <sighs> that's a tough question, and we're in the middle of this right now. I think I expanded on it earlier, actually. Uh, we don't. What, the only thing we can be positive about is reducing consumption is a positive. The reducing the use of any kind of product, whether it's a cup, a fork, or a car, or travel, reduction redu eliminates the environmental impact of that particular activity. Everything else is trade-offs. So we have to analyze the trade-offs. A plastic cup has associated environmental impacts from the petroleum that it's produced to the chemicals that are admitted during its production, to its disposal in a landfill, to it, or ideally in a landfill, if not into the environment, all of these environmental impacts that we want to eliminate. Moving to ceramic or metal or glass or multi-use plastic, in all cases, is generally better in eliminating those impacts that I noted, but they also have their own impacts, such as higher embodied energy, which means it takes more energy to produce a ceramic cup than it does a plastic cup. So the ceramic cup has to be used a certain number of times in order to compensate for the environmental impact of the plastic cups. So if I use a ceramic cup once and then drop it and it breaks, I lose all the, the advantage, the environmental advantage of that ceramic cup. So uh, there are trade-offs involved. We have to measure these trade-offs and we have to try, there's also of course washing and sewage and soaps and, and detergents and things like this. So we have to really measure those trade-offs. We're convinced at this point, we're in the middle of the process of, of analyzing. I believe that we'll get to the best environmental result in the end, uh, but of course reduction in plastic, two million plastic cups a year or paper cups a year is, is, is beyond uh, what I think we should be doing. We can certainly reduce that amount in the process, find a better environmental alternative. And with that, I'm going to conclude. And I'd like to introduce to you Professor Shulamit Levenberg of the Faculty of Biomedical Engineering. And over to her. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you for joining us. And happy to be back to all of you. Uh, I would like to talk today about our work on cultivated meat and to describe how we got to this topic starting from tissue engineering for medical application. So in talking about the research in the lab first, I would like to thank all the students and all the researchers that uh, joined me in this uh, journey. And of course, to thank all the funding agencies and all our collaborators. So when we talk about um, and now just to see Corona uh, picture, now we still work in the lab, but of course keeping all the distance that is uh, needed. So when talking about uh, tissue engineering for medical application, uh, this uh, field actually arises from the need for 
uh, tissues and organs for implantation. When we have a tissue that is damaged, it can be a bone that is broken or uh, injured spinal cord or organ that is not functioning like the pancreas. So when we, we need uh, to repair this uh, organ or tissue, we can either relate on donors, but we know that there, there are limits in, uh, in donations and also the recipient need to get immunosuppression for all his life. And the other option is to get from the same patient, but to take one tissue to repair the other, to take a vein to, for a bypass operation or to take a healthy bone to repair the injured bone in the other leg. But all these operations are long and, and we're actually damaging now two places instead of one. So tissue engineering emerged with the idea to find a, another source for uh, tissues and organ. And the idea is to take cells from the patient, and now you can uh, culture the cells in the lab, expand them because you need many cells for one tissue. And then you, after you cultivate the cells and expand them, you can grow them on 3D uh, scaffold and 3D matrices. And they can be uh, one that are biodegradable, they will degrade over time and you will be left only with the, uh, with the nature tissue. So the cells on the 3D matrix can now differentiate and form the tissue and when you have the tissue or the organ, you can then implant them to repair or replace the damaged tissue. And since we know that each uh, tissue has more than one cell type, also in the lab, we can now uh, mix several cell types uh, together. If we can have the movie working, then we will be able to see how we can now take the cells together and mix them uh, in the lab. For, for example, if we have in muscle tissue, we have uh, endothelial cells that forming the blood vessels, we have muscle cells, we have the support cells, the secretory matrix, we can mix them uh, in the lab, <clears throat> in the tube, after finding the right uh, ratio between the cells and the, the right uh, medium composition, then we can take them and seed them onto the 3D matrix, on, onto this sponge that uh, the cells can go into the pores of the sponge and the sponge can be degradable uh, later on. And then the cells will start to organize. But in tissue engineering, we know that one of the problems is when we want to implant the tissue, we need the tissue to be vascularized. We need it to get blood and oxygen. So we and others actually found that if we add to this cell mix, if we add endothelial cells, the cells that naturally form the blood vessels, if we add them, they will start to form the tube even in this 3, 3D setting in the lab. And you can see here the tubes that are being formed and now being connected. And if we add support cells, some of them will differentiate to support cells and will be recruited to the vessels and will stabilize the tubes. And if we add skeletal uh, myoblasts, they will form the, the fibers and the fibers now will have muscle tissue together with all the blood vessels uh, that are needed uh, for later on for enhancing the vascularization. So if we now have the uh, vascularized tissue, um, <clears throat> we can now use it to replace uh, damaged tissue in the body. So we, we can take the engineered uh, tissue and use it to repair a, a damaged muscle tissue in the abdominal wall. So here is the engineered tissue, the vascularized one with all the engineered vasculature, and we can implant it and it will now induce the penetration of the vessels from the host and we will also see connections that are being formed between the engineered vessels and the host tubes. You can see the green connected uh, to the red. So overall this will enhance the vascularization of the construct because when we have these connections some of the engineered vessels will become functional and blood will start to flow in them bringing the blood faster to the inner part uh, of the construct. So at the end we will have in enhancing, we will enhance the vascularization uh, of, of the graft. So this is how it looked under the microscope. This is in real life, not animation. You can see the engineered vessels in green in the construct. And in blue, you can see the host vessels now getting inside uh, the implant. And if you will wait over days, we will see them going inside and inside, filling the uh, inner part of, of the construct of the muscle implant. And in red, you see vessels that are functional, that blood is flowing through them because we inject uh, a fluorescent uh, dye uh, into the blood. 
So we can follow this over the days and in, in higher magnification, you can really appreciate the nice connection that are being formed between the host vessels and the engineered vessels in green, the, the blue and the green, as you can see here. And if we now look at the, where the red is going, whether the engineered vessels in green are becoming functional, you can see that some of them have the red staining inside them, meaning that they become functional and blood is, is flowing uh, through them. So if we want to take the uh, tissue engineering another step further, now we can start to use uh, bioprinting. We can use printers that are really uh, unique because the ink is uh, either the scaffold or the cells, the bio ink together with the cells. So we can use different heads and print different cells and print also the scaffold as we build the tissue. So we can really now go into larger tissues and also design them very carefully to fit the damage area exactly. So what you see here in the movie, you see an example of building such tissue and you can see that in this tissue, we also have a, an example of a large vessels inside and we can now uh, build the tissue uh, to our needs. And this is where now tissue engineering is going using bioprinting and we established a bioprinting center, center at the Technion at the Faculty of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, researchers can come and now print their tissue, bring their own bio ink, bring their own cells and build the tissue as they want. And you can see here another printer, uh, again, using different heads to print the different part of the tissue. And you can see here uh, another design of more complicated, more complex uh, a vessel uh, network that is now being printed uh, in the tissue, as you can see here uh, in the movie. So if we have an engineered uh, tissue, vascularized, uh, how we can use it in the clinic in the future? So I would like to show three examples of uh, the use of such uh, tissue. And the first one is to repair uh, diabetes. And what you see here, we were able to show that we can vascularize pancreatic islets. And this can later on replace the need for injection of insulin. So one can now implant the islets and they will secrete insulin when the blood sugar is, is going high. And what we show that if we just take some islets and implant them under the skin in diabetic mice, they will not be able to do the work because they're not survive well. But if we now vascularize the islets, and you can see here in the image, the red islets with the green vasculature around it, if we now implant it under the skin of diabetic mice, the blood uh, glucose level reduced to normal and we actually repaired uh, the mice from diabetes. And of course, this, we look forward to the uh, point where we'll be able to do it uh, in humans and this will be really, um, really exciting. Another field, another area is a patch for the heart. We know that when we have, uh, uh, sometimes we have, we don't have enough oxygen getting to all the muscle of the heart when we have heart attack and then part of the muscle is not functioning and the heart as a, as a pump, uh, as a whole is not functioning well. And what we want to uh, engineer is actually cardiac, cardiac patch and you can see the cardiomyocyte now beating together. Uh, and what we show that if we add the vascularization, if we are able to engineer the tissue and incorporate all the vascular network inside it, uh, this will help the integration after implanting onto the heart. And this is here a red heart. We can implant the patch onto the heart and if it's pre-vascularized, it will integrate uh, better and uh, survive better. Another area is the spinal cord injury. Uh, we got to this uh, lately because of a request from uh, uh, people with a spinal cord uh, injury that came to us and say, maybe you can use your technique, your tissue engineering capabilities to try and find a solution uh, for a paralyzed uh, uh, patient. And we decided to use a model of uh, paralyzed rats. And you can see that they're dragging their back legs. Uh, because they have an injury in their spinal cord and they will not repair spontaneously. And what we decided to engineer is a piece of a tissue that have stem cells that will secrete important nutrient uh, into the spinal cord injury site and we implanted it in the injury site. And after waiting for uh, two, three weeks, this is what we could see. You can see that the rats really uh, start uh, walking almost uh, normal. And this was really, really exciting because we did not expect 
such a repair, such a recovery. You can see that all the motor functions in the legs are getting back because of the implantation of the, of the engineered tissue that is now uh, providing signals for the axons to elongate and connect and repair the injury site. So we can see that tissue engineering can, is very meaningful and have a, really a great potential to help us to repair or replace uh, damaged tissues. And from the work of the lab, uh, several uh, companies were founded based on the technology uh, that we develop. And I would like to focus on the direction that we took with Aleph Farms, where we actually took the knowledge of tissue engineering uh, to uh, the food uh, direction. So the idea is that instead of taking cells from the patient, we can take cells from the cow and then seed it on a biodegradable or not biodegradable, but on a matrix that now can be edible. And now we can form muscle tissue, similar to what I showed you before, we can form a muscle tissue um, that now can be cooked and you know, eaten as a, and become a cultured steak in the plate. So you can see here the myoblasts uh, from the cow that are grown in the lab and forming the fibers. You can see the elongated fibers with the, all the green uh, nuclei in the, inside them. So all the red lines are actually muscle fibers. And we <clears throat> were able to show that if we use our technique of co-culturing several cell types together on this edible scaffold, we can form a very nice differentiated uh, muscle tissue and this was uh, published in uh, Nature Food. And uh, you can see this was the work of uh, Tom Benoyer from my lab that really pushed us toward this direction of using our tissue engineering uh, technology toward uh, the food uh, direction. So then after we developed this technology of culturing the cells and forming uh, engineered tissue on the edible scaffold, uh, we founded the company Aleph Farms. And what you see here, the steak that was actually uh, engineered in Aleph Farm. And you can see the chef that is now uh, plating it and people that are tasting it. And people said that it's really very similar uh, to the normal, uh, to the native uh, steak. And this is very exciting because we can see that tissue engineering can give uh, um, hope and can be meaningful, not only in medical application, but in uh, other application. So a little bit about Aleph Farm and the concept of why we want to cultivate meats, why we want to create these species of steak. And I think the answer is quite, uh, I think everyone can imagine why it's, it's so important because we, the cow can still be happy and we still can have the steak in the plate without harming the animal. And I think this is the main important thing, but also it's very important for our planet because we know that uh, growing the cows and all the industry around it is really harming our planet and if we want to think about sustainability we have to think about other ways to bring food and to bring meat uh, to the world <coughs> and um, if we want to replace uh, slaughtered meat we can think about two options one is to use plant-based ba plant plant-based meat or we can use cell cultured or cell cultivated uh, meat, meaning that we still use the cells, we still use um, all the nutrition that are important in the meat and we will still have them uh, in the product. So what was the solution of Aleph Farm is to take cells uh, with art harming the animals and expand them. And then the idea is to use bio farms. You can see here, the bio farm that are now a clean environment similar to what we have when we have a, a, when we have yogurt farms or cheese farms now we just have clean farms for cultivating uh, the meat or the steak and this will be very um, we can really focus on the right nutrition and we can really mimic the native tissue just instead of doing it inside the animal we can now do it in, do it in this uh, clean uh, environment in the bio farms and um, so what are the main concepts this the concept of the companies want to have a, a platform for scalability and this is the company already have and to use natural cells non-gmo and very natural and to focus on the quality, so we'll have a meat bite very similar to what we are used to, to create 
a steak, not only grounded beef, but really a piece of uh, muscle tissue, as we know, uh, to make. And also the focus on sustainability, making our world a better world and to, to give something to the global uh, ecosystem. And some, uh, you know, a little bit on the roadmap of the, of the company, when we started the work in the lab, after that we established the company, you can see the, uh, the first uh, prototype uh, demonstration of what you saw in the movie, people tasting it and, and seeing that it's really similar to the, to the native uh, tissue. And then you can see in the future developing the biofarm, the pilot biofarm that is now being established in the lab and eventually uh, bringing uh, everything to, to the market, which of course will be very, very uh, exciting. So I would like to end here. I hope I gave you a little bit of a, a glimpse to our work on tissue engineering and how, how it can be important, not only for medical application, but also for improving uh, our planet. Thank you very much and happy to be Shvat. And I'm happy now to answer some questions. Okay, so I'm happy to answer the questions. And I see here one question. Uh, are cultured meat products considered to be meaty or parvent? This is a really excellent question. I'm being asked uh, it uh, many times. Um, we don't know yet. The rabbis need to consider how uh, this uh, will be. There are different opinions. One say that because it's something totally new, then it will be considered parv. But others say, no, these are cells from the cow. These are bovine cells. This is meat. And this is a real steak. So uh, this would be meaty. So... Um, this still need to be uh, considered by the rabbis and as soon as it will be like the first uh, product in the market, I'm sure that uh, we will get the final uh, answer of how it should be considered. Um, another question that I see here, how much longer until cultured meat is available in the market, in the supermarket? So um, the company is working on it and it should be very soon, but what's important for Aleph Farm is not to be like the first maybe, but to do it really good and uh, to have the best product. Um, so uh, I think we will see it uh, quite soon and everything is ready. Uh, the scalability, the pilot, the biofarm and um, the steak. Uh, the first thing will be the thin cut uh, uh, meat and then uh, the company will go to thicker construct. Um, the next question, do you continue to research and develop the subject beyond what was published in uh, Nature Food? Uh, so yes, we have uh, sponsored research from Ale Farms and we continue to develop uh, this uh, together with the company to look into new solution, to look into the, the future uh, behind the first uh, uh, product and uh, to develop um, newer things. So if there are no more uh, questions, so I would like to thank you all and wish you a uh, happy to be Shvat and a uh, good night. <laughs>